Welcome to Real Horror Stories. Today, we delve into the mysteries and dark chapters of our past. I'm your host, Suchata Sharma, and today we journey back to the late 17th century, to a very small town in colonial Massachusetts, where a chilling chapter in American history unfolded. The Salem Witch Trials. Let's step back in time and begin our exploration of the Salem Witch Trials. But first remember to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And if you enjoy my videos, please leave a comment. It really helps me a lot. Now let's begin. Salem Village was settled in 1626 by Puritans, a group of English Protestants. Life was strict and isolated for the people of Salem. Present-day Salem Village covers the areas of Danvers, Massachusetts. Between the beginning of 1692 and the middle of 1693, the Salem Witch Trials took place in the colony of Massachusetts. In this trial, more than 200 people were accused of practicing witchcraft, or you can say the devil's magic. I know, it's weird, right? And according to records, 20 were executed. Out of 20, 19 people were hanged, and one was stoned to death. According to the book, A Delusion of Satan, the full story of the Salem Witch Trials, the accused witches were considered dangerous prisoners as compared to murderers and rapists. As the most dangerous inmates, the witches were kept in the dungeons. These dungeons were dark, bitterly cold and so damp that water ran down the walls. They reeked on unwashed human bodies and excrement. These dungeons were close to the banks of a tidal river. They were infested with water rats. You can say that these places were a breeding ground for diseases. But accused witches were not seen as human and treated even worse than animals. Their limbs were weighed down and their movements were restricted by manacles chained to the walls. While in prison, the accused were repeatedly humiliated by being forced to undergo physical examinations of their body. The examiners were looking for physical evidence that the accused or like witches might have, such as mark of the devil, or a test from which the witch's familiar was believed to have nursed from. During the examinations, the prisoners who were mostly elderly were stripped naked in front of a group of people and their bodies were poked and prodded and any suspicious marks or moles found were pricked with needles. The female prisoners' breasts were often examined multiple times a day for the signs of lactation or breastfeeding and the appearance of their breasts were recorded and discussed in the courtroom. In his book, Salem Witchcraft, with an account of Salem Village and a history of opinions on witchcraft and kindred spirits, historian and former Salem mayor Charles W. describes his disgust over the treatment of the prisoners. A number of historians have speculated as to why the witch hunts occurred and why certain people were singled out. These proposed reasons have included personal vendettas, fear of strong women, and economic competition. Since the 17th century, the story of the trials has become synonymous with paranoia and injustice, fueled by xenophobia, religious extremism, and long brewing social tensions. The witch hunt continues to beguile the popular imagination more than 300 years later. Let's discuss how this all started and what led Salem to this horror. For this, we'll have to go back to the medieval era. In the medieval and early modern eras, many religions, including Christianity, taught that the devil could give people known as witches the power to harm others in return for their loyalty. A witchcraft craze rippled through Europe from the 1300s to the end of the 1600s. Tens of thousands of supposed witches, mostly women, were executed. Even though the Salem trials happened at the end of the European craze, they started because of what was going on in the area. So in 1689, English monarchs William and Mary started a war with France in the American colonies, 
known as King William's War to colonists. The conflict ravaged regions of upstate New York, Nova Scotia, and Quebec, sending refugees into the country of Essex, and specifically Salem Village, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The displaced people placed a strain on Salem's resources, aggravating the existing rivalry between families with ties to the wealth of the Port of Salem and those who still depended on agriculture. The Reverend Samuel Paris was also a source of trouble. He was Salem Village's first ordained minister in 1689 and he quickly got a bad name for being strict and greedy. The Puritan people in the village thought that all the fighting was caused by the devil. In January 1692, Paris' daughter Elizabeth, age 9, and niece Abigail Williams, age 11, started having fits. They screamed, threw things, uttered peculiar sounds, and contorted themselves into strange positions. A local doctor blamed the supernatural. Another girl, 12-year-old Anne Putnam Jr., experienced similar episodes. On February 29, under pressure from magistrates, Jonathan Corwin and John Hathorn, colonial officials who tried local cases, the girls blamed three women for afflicting them. Tituba, a Caribbean woman enslaved by the Paris family. Sarah Good, a homeless beggar, and Sarah Osborne, an elderly impoverished woman. And as soon as these three names were given, the witch hunt begins. All three women were brought before the local magistrates and interrogated for several days, starting on March 1st, 1692. So just imagine, you have been accused of a crime you did not commit. It's impossible to prove your innocence. If you insist that you are innocent anyway, you are likely be found guilty and executed. But if you confess, apologize and implicate others for good measure, you might go free. Do you give a false confession or risk a public hanging? This was the choice facing those accused of witchcraft in the village of Salem, Massachusetts. And obviously, one of the three women, Tituba, who was slave, confessed. She said, the devil came to me and bid me to serve him. She described elaborate images of black dogs, red cats, yellow birds, and a tall man with white hair, who wanted her to sign his book. She admitted that she had signed the book and claimed there were several other witches looking to destroy the Puritans. With the seeds of paranoia planted, a stream of accusations followed over the next few months. Charges against Martha Corey, a loyal member of the church in Salem Village, greatly concerned the community. If she could be a witch, then any woman could be. Magistrates even questioned Sarah Good's four-year-old daughter and made her testimony. Dorothy, whose timid answers were construed as a confession. The questioning got more serious in April when the colony's deputy governor, Thomas Danforth, and his assistants attended the hearings. Dozens of people from Salem and other Massachusetts villages were brought in for questioning. On May 27, 1692, Governor William Phipps ordered the establishment of a special court of oil to hear and to decide for Suffolk, Essex, and Middlesex counties. The first accused witch brought in front of the special court was Bridget Bishop, an older woman known for her gossipy habits and promiscuity. When asked if she committed witchcraft, Bishop responded, I am as innocent as the child unborn. The defense must not have been convincing because she was found guilty and on June 10 became the first person hanged on what was later called Gallows Hill. Just a few days after the court was established, respected minister Cotton Mather wrote a letter pleading with the court not to permit spectral evidence, like testimony about dreams and visions. The court largely ignored this request, sentencing five people to death by hanging in July, five more in August and eight in September. On October 3rd, following in his son Cotton's footsteps, 
increase Martha, then president of Harvard, denounced the use of spectral evidence. He quoted, It was better that ten suspected witches should escape than one innocent person be condemned. In response to these pleas and his own wife's questioning, as a suspected witch, prohibited further arrests and released many accused witches. He dissolved the coat of oil, also on October 29th, replacing it with the Superior Court of Judicature, which disallowed spectral evidence and condemned just three out of 56 defendants. By May 1693, Phipps had pardoned all those imprisoned on witchcraft charges, but the damage was already done. Nineteen men and women had been hanged on Gallows Hill. Gillies Corey, Martha's 71-year-old husband, was pressed to death in September 1692 with heavy stones after refusing to submit himself to a trial. At least five of the accused died in jail. Even animals fell victim to the mass hysteria, with colonists in Andover and Salem village killing two dogs believed to be linked to the devil. Well, let's discuss what do we think of it now? All girls and young women ranging in age from 9 to 20, who screamed, writhed, barked and displayed other horrifying symptoms that were claimed as a signs of satanic possession. Often referred to as the afflicted girls, they included members of prominent village families as well as domestic servants and refugees of King William's War, a long-running conflict that pitted English settlers against Wabanaki Native Americans and their French allies. Historians have offered numerous possible explanations for the Salem accusers' actions, including economic hardship, deliberate fraud, mass hysteria, mental illness or convulsive ergotism, a condition caused by a fungus that grows on rye and other grains. But the truth is undoubtedly more complex and impossible to know. The trials are filled with cautionary tales about how catastrophically bad things can go when legal proceedings fail to offer certain minimum guarantees. They also provide a perpetual reminder of the consequences of fear unchecked by the sort of reasonable judgment that the law demands. What do you think of these trials? Let me know in the comment section and I will see you next time.